I'd like to start off by thanking you guys for having me. I really appreciate uh, appreciate everyone coming out to learn about Spring Security. Um, and uh, thank you for Teresa for organizing. So um, thank you to everyone. Um, my name is Rob Winch, and I'm the project lead for Spring Security. And today we're going to be talking about uh, Spring Security 6.3. And we'll also probably, depending on our time, take a look at some uh, sneak peek into some other features as well. But before we get started, I'd like to kind of get a, an idea for where everyone's at. Because I don't like to give like a set presentation. I kind of just go with the flow. And uh, by that, I mean I want to kind of see what where everyone else is at and kind of adapt the presentation to kind of fit the audience. So first of all, uh, who here has used Java? Start at the beginning, all right? Who here is very comfortable with Java, OK? Who here has used Spring? Who here is very comfortable with Spring? Yeah? If I told you to set it up with XML from uh, like uh, Spring 2.0, could you guys do that? Yeah? OK. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, 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 I'm testing the waters. You know, I just got to gotta, gotta just get a little feel here. OK. Who here has used uh, Spring Security? OK. Who here is very comfortable with Spring Security? This guy's ready to do the presentation. Come on up. <laughs> no, it's OK. Uh, OK, so who here has used Spring Security since uh, like the XML namespace days? Anyone use XML namespace? Who here has used it at CG days? Anyone? Yeah, OK. He's ready to do the presentation. <laughs> All right. OK. Well, th that, that does give me a good, uh, a good feel for where everyone's at. Uh, one, one other uh, question. Who here has uh, done uh, stuff with OAuth? Anyone done stuff with OAuth? Who here is familiar with like the OAuth specification? OK. All right. Cool. All right, well, that gives me a little bit of an idea. I might like kind of pop some questions in here and there, and we'll uh, redirect. Um, feel free to ask questions right away. That's the best time to ask a question. And um, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. So this, uh, if you haven't already got it, uh, this uh, source code is here. Um, I don't have slides for you guys, because this is the only slide I have. So hopefully that's OK. <laughs> I mean, I guess I could send you this slide if you really wanted, but it'd be kind of like, you know, recursive, I guess. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. And so I created a, a simple application. And let's see here. Get this big enough that it's visible. All right. So I created an application. And, you know, I do say that the UI on this is gorgeous. I did it myself. You can tell. But you know, the thing about it is, if I made a beautiful UI, you guys would not trust me as a security expert. So I just kind of toned it down a little bit, and, then, and this is what we got. All right. But no, more seriously, though, I really want to focus on a very simple application so we can focus on the security of the application rather than worrying about a complex domain or JavaScript and CSS and stuff like that. So we're really, this is really like a simple application, very intentionally. And you can see I have a uh, inbox and a message. And I, uh, Josh uh, Long has sent me an example or a message. Hi, Rob. And this message is from Josh. I know I'm very creative. Um, and I get even more creative with the message that I sent to Josh. This message is from Rob. The main point here is there's a couple messages, and they're coming from different people being sent to different people. And we're, we're going to talk about like, how to secure this application. Now, can anyone tell me what is wrong security-wise with this application? Authentication. Authentication. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. It's a little bit of a trick question. There's no security, so that's the problem. You know. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see if we can add, add security. Authentication is definitely the first thing you would expect, though. All right, so let's see how we can add, uh, add Spring Security to this application. Uh, we're going to use uh, the assistant uh, here in the IDE. If you haven't used start.spring.io, you probably should. But um, 
you can just go ahead and select Spring Security, and we'll look at the dependencies that we add here. I'm happening to use Gradle. You can use Maven if you so choose. Not starting any uh, tabs versus spaces sort of arguments here. It's just happened to be what I chose. And we have um, a Spring Boot Starter Security. We have a Time Leaf extension. And then we also have the testing support. Okay. And before I do that, I actually I forgot almost. Much like security tests are often an afterthought, I apologize. But I did actually write some tests. And I wanted to just show you that we have some tests. And unless it updated in the background, the class path, which I think I have to do explicitly, um, it, it already updated. So I have a test that's failing. We'll see how to fix that shortly. But I have some other tests. That test is failing because security has now been applied. And we need to figure out how to fix our tests. All right? So um, let's go ahead and restart our uh, application here. And just for good measure, I want to make sure. Um, there's one thing that bites me in these live demos. It's like the IDE integration. So we're just going to, just for good measure, make sure that it really is updated for the main class path as well. All right. So I went ahead and started it up, and it should look a little different now. We got a login screen. And all I had to do was add these dependencies. And the thing, I, I'm pointing this out because like this, this uh, login page, I didn't actually have to code it. Well, actually, I did code this because I code Spring Security. But you would not have to do it. It just comes into the application, right? And uh, we'll see how to customize it later because, of course, I'm not really the best with UI. I was joking earlier. Sorry to say. But uh, um, you can customize the UI to meet your application's needs. And we'll kind of see how to do that uh, in a bit. But for now, we have this login screen. And like, how do I log into it? Well, the default user is user. And the password, we don't do a default password because we don't want to um, have a vulnerability in the application. And so we have, uh, we have logged to the console this uh, this randomly generated password. <clears throat> and we'll go ahead and log in. And then we can sign in. And now we see the application again. So there's, there's nothing uh, super exciting about it, but it was very easy to get up and running. And we also have a log out page. So that's pretty cool, too. I'm just going to grab something here while we're, I forgot to grab. Make sure I don't uh, miss anything important. All right. So, we, we've, uh, we've seen how we can add Spring Security, but we still have that broken test. Let's see how we can fix the broken test. All right. Um, we come over here. And the broken test, we'll just run all of them. Did you have questions on the fly? Or oh, yeah. Please go ahead. When you were able to log out there, did it just clear like a J session ID? Yes. Uh, so the question is, when, when I logged out there, was it just clearing out a J session ID? And that's a great question. So first of all, it clears, uh, it invalidates the session. So HTTP session dot invalidate. Um, and then the other thing is, is it does have, a, it does have some additional logout handlers uh, depending upon your setup. So a logout handler is something that happens at logout time. Um, but another thing that it does do when you, the container, when you invalidate a session, it actually clears out that cookie, it like uh, removes it from there. So yes, it does, it does clear that out, but it also invalidates the object. Good question. Um, all right, so we see that we have, uh, have this failure. And um, the failure basically is, is that I'm requesting messages in inbox. Anyone use mock MVC? Anyone use that for testing? OK, so I'm using mock MVC here. And it's requesting messages inbox. But it's expecting a 200, but I'm getting a 401. And I'm betting you can guess why. It's because I added security and I'm not logged in. And you know, one of the things that I've seen uh, all over the internet and from people is like, oh, hey, I got a great idea. My tests aren't working. Why don't we just disable security and then the tests will pass? But guess what happens when you do that? People forget to enable security and they deploy to production. And it's not a good idea. So rather than doing that, we have great testing support in Spring Security. And so I can just say with mock user. And this user doesn't have to exist in any database or anything. It just, it just runs as is. 
So we'll rerun this test. And I'm not sure why it's running so slow, but it's running. OK, and you might not be able to see it, but it's a green check uh, checkbox now. So now, now we're logged in for that test. And you know, Spring Security has really good testing support, so I encourage you to use that in your project rather than disabling your security and, and risking you know, uh, deploying to production. Yes? Does that only work with mock MVC, or does it work if you use the actual servlet filters? OK, so the question is, does it work with uh, servlet filters as well? So um, it, it does work with the servlet filters. The, it's it's a, a yes and no. So mock MVC can work with just filters. Um, and there's a little bit of extras in there that basically make sure it gets set up. So the problem that you run with, with mock, so with mock user will first of all work with method security if you're just using method security directly. Um, but the thing that you run into in Spring Security is uh, it's, it's a set of filters, and we'll kind of go over the stack uh, in a little more detail. You have a set of filters. And one of those filters, uh, typically, depending on your configuration, will look in the HTTP session and try to load the security context and then set it. And so what happens uh, in a typical uh, situation, if you don't have the test support, is if you're running those filters, that, it, that integration where it reads the HTTP session and then sets it will actually clear out anything that you've set beforehand. So this test support is basically like a way of ensuring that when it reads in that session, it kind of ignores it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Uh, one, one more question. Yes, please. I'm not sure if you're going to cover this, but uh, you said, so with, with mock user, can we specify like the scope or something like that? If, like, let's say like the endpoint have a, you know, like a scope, uh, like control, like uh, say, no, no, like the user without the scope cannot access to this. Oh, uh, so the question is, uh, can you dis define like a scope for it? So on with mock user, um, it has some defaults. And I, I think I understood that as, uh, are there like authorities or roles that you can define on there? And so by default, the, the, uh, the username is user, and the roles are user. But you can override that just by specifying it in the annotation. Does that help? Is that what you're asking? OK, great. Yes, please. Only access to some emails, right? Yep. Uh, can you? Yeah, we can do that, and we will. Uh, we will cover that too, or we'll, we'll try to get cover that. Um, you know, it's. Uh, I don't know how long we. I think we have an hour and a half. Is that right, Teresa? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so if if we get it get to it in an hour and a half, then we'll get to it. So, all right, great. Um, thank you. All very very good questions. Um, let's see. So after we. Oh yes, please. Sure. Uh, so I'm assuming there are some off-the-shelf filters that are going on uh, behind the scenes. Uh, do you have the possibility to configure that or to customize those filters? Or like, for example, you know, with other authorization mechanisms, you, you yes. like those filters. Yeah, so the question is, can you customize the filters, uh, for example, with other authorization mechanisms? And the answer is, Yes, you can do the filters, and yes, you can cu uh, customize the authorization mechanisms. And ideally, we'll be able to cover that as well. So, all right. So, um, we have a lot to cover, but I'm going to do a little bit of choose your own adventure. I like to, I like to kind of do it this way. So, um, who here uh, is familiar with um, why you shouldn't use uh, do your own security? Anyone familiar with that? All right. So uh, there are a couple of hands. All right. So who here? So a lot of people I hear uh, like talk to like, uh, Rob, Spring Security is great, but you know what? All it is is comparing a username and password. <laughs> Anyone can do that. I'm like, I'm glad you brought that up because it's not just comparing a username and password. So Spring Security ha is kind of broken into three main parts: authentication, authorization, and protection against common exploits. And a lot of uh, protection against exploits actually overlap with the authentication and authorization, but there's also additional ones. So who here is familiar with uh, an attack called session fixation? Anyone heard of that? Got one hand? Two hands? Three hands? All right. 
I'll, I'll, I'll briefly describe it. So a session fixation attack is an attack uh, where oftentimes in the URL, the, um, the J session ID is presented in the URL. Anyone ever do an application and they're like, hey, I see the J session ID in the URL? And that's, that's your servlet container helping you out. But the problem with that is, let's, let's assume a scenario. Let's pretend that I'm evil. Well, we don't have to pretend. I'm pretty evil. But <laughs> all right, so let's pretend that I'm evil. And, uh, and I go to bank.com. And I, I go there, and I establish my own session. And bank.com allows the URL to accept a J session ID. I send out an email to all my victims, I mean friends or victims. They could overlap. And, and the, the URL set, that the email says, change your password right away. You've been breached. But the URL actually has the J session ID that I just established in my own browser. So all these people are racing out to the internet to like, uh, change their password, right? And maybe I even like establish new sessions for each of these people so that uh, they don't override each other. So they go out there and they log in. What happens when they log in? Well, their session, their user information, is bound to the session ID that I already have. And so now, I am logged in as them because of that URL. And there's other ways to do session fixation, but that's one of the easiest ones to describe. And so can anyone tell me what the best way to secure against ses session fixation is? Yes? So I think that's like a standard thing. When you log in a user, you invalidate whatever was done before you create a new session. Yeah, so the answer uh, that was provided um, is when you log in, you invalidate the session, and then you associate the user to a new session. And I'll accept that as partially correct. But the correct answer is use Spring Security. <laughs> OK? All right. Because the other thing that you want to do is you also want to prevent that from happening in the first place. So Spring Security will also ensure that your URLs, when you're encoding them with the servlet container, don't actually contain the J session ID in the first place. And it will also block requests coming in that have the J session ID on it. And so that is, that is the proper procedure. But the other thing, too, is like if you didn't think of that or you didn't have time to do that, Spring Security does this out of the box. So I was giving you a hard time. That is the right answer. But you know, yeah. I have to promote Spring Security. <laughs> All right, so who here has heard of, um, of cross-site request forgery? Quite a few hands. We'll skip over that one. Cross-site request forgery, another attack that Spring Security prevents. Um, who here has heard of breach? Breach attacks, OK? Not very many. I'm not going to go into detail on that one, but breach is a type of attack that, uh, in reality, you need to do something outside of S Spring Security. But it's where you can do a man in the middle on HTTPS if you're using compression. Um, and so the ideal way to, and this happens when it finds certain repeated values within a web page. It needs that in order to do it. And it does it through what's known as a side channel attack. Um, but in order, to, in order to prevent against this, like in a defense in depth mechanism, Spring Security actually will ensure that your cross-site request forgery token is never presented on the page in, like, as the same value. It does this by XORing it with random bytes and putting those random bytes alongside it. So, um, again, like these are things that, like clickjacking attacks, is another example. Another one that I think is surprisingly common in hand rolled security that people forget about is your browser cache. People log out and they're like, "I'm done." Someone hits the back button and they're like, "No, you're not." <laughs> right? The, there's lots of stuff that uh, Spring Security will take care of uh, for you out of the box. That uh, it's important. All right. So enough enough about that. Let's talk about uh, who, here, who here knows about password encoding, how to safely secure passwords. We've got quite a few hands. I think we can, uh, we can uh, skip over that one, I think. Um, but I do like to show this bit. So one of the things that's kind of annoying about our application right now, there's a lot because we just started, but one of the things that I think is uh, particularly annoying is that, uh, oh, I did the wrong one. Apologies. Um, one of the things that's particularly annoying is that we have to type our password every time. And so um, 
what we can do is, you know, I, I'm just going to briefly mention it. You could do something like this that people probably find on the internet everywhere. But obviously, this is insecure. Um, we shouldn't really do that. So people ask, often ask me, how can I actually ensure that it's secure? Well, has anyone used the Spring command line at all? No? So Spring command line has, you can install this. Just look for a Spring Boot command line. And then there's an encode password. And then it outputs in bcrypt. So I'm assuming you guys know how that's, that's the proper way to, a quick summary is that's the proper way to store passwords, or at least one of them. Can you please make it a bit bigger? Oh, yes. On the console. Yeah, right. On the console. I'm not going to be doing that too much, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to paste it into the IDE so you'll be able to see what I did. So this is, this is actually what it was. Can you see that OK? It's long. No, no one will, yeah, it's intentionally long, yeah. So, um, but is that, is that visible now? Like, can you, OK, just check it. Um, all right, cool. So, yeah, basically we have, uh, we have a way to make sure that, A, I don't have to type the password every time. Um, and now, don't tell anyone, but my password's password, right? <laughs> speaking of which, though, um, speaking of which, anyone seen in, the, uh, in Spring Security that uh, we have a uh, new way to protect against things like that? So I'm going to create. A really fun controller, and I can't spell, but just pretend like I can. And we're going to do rest controller, and then get mapping. And you'll see why I'm calling this a CVE controller in just a minute, partially because the URL has CVE in it, but also because. And then we're going to return. Actually, we're going to start up by final user detail service users. Try to scroll that up where you can see in the back. And then we'll return this.users.load username, get password. All right? So, CV controller. Why, why would I do that? Well, I'm just simulating like there's different ways that passwords can leak SQL injection, being logged to the logs, et cetera. So we're just pretending that someone had a CVE, and this is probably a little too obvious to, um, for most cases, but uh, it, it does uh, show what could happen. All right, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do that, but then I'm also going to add some custom security config real quick. Security config. And so this is, or earlier we were at, at, it was asked, can I customize things? Now we're going to start to see some security configuration. And here's one of, the, one of the customizations. So enable web security. This is, this is basically how you explicitly enable it. And then in here, I'm going to create a thing called a, um, uh, a Compromise password checker. Let me do this too so you can see a little better. And then we'll return new um, have I been pwned. Anyone heard of have I been pwned? Yeah? A few heads? No? A lot of laughs? All right, well, have I been pwned? We'll, we'll take a look at that in just a second. So I'm going to restart this. We're going to come back here. And it's going to, did I just beat it? Oh, I just, I was too fast. All right, so user, password, the provided password is compromised. Please change your password. So like, how did I know that? Well, let's see, have I been pwned? So there's this, uh, there's this real uh, cool website, Have I Been Pwned? Helps you figure out if your credentials have been in a breach, and you can just provide your email address. And they also have like a, a password check, and you can type in password, and let's see if it's been pwned. Anyone think so? 10 million times. OK. <laughs> so I guess I don't have a very secure password. Let's, let's uh, fix that. I put a 1 after it. 
Oh, it's three million times. That didn't really help. OK, so this is kind of a fun thing to do, right? And you might say, uh, just one second on the questions. I'm going to wrap up with this section, and I'll get questions. Um, and so you might say, OK, well, that's cool, but I don't want to send my passwords over to this service. And like, what's going on? How does this work? Well, it actually doesn't, when you check it, you don't actually send your password over. You send like a partial, uh, partial hash of the password. And so you know, it, it does have mechanisms to keep it safe. But you can also download the database uh, directly. And so you're not actually even sending anything over the wire. Um, and so there's a way to, like right now, this is just giving like an error message. There's ways to like, um, basically handle that. Like, you probably send someone to a um, please uh, please change your password sort of thing. But out of the box, Spring Security doesn't have like a change password UI flow. So that's what it does right now. Um, now that I've finished, kind of finished that section, uh, are there any questions? Anyone want to say anything? Yes, please. Uh, did you write, uh, have I been pwned in? Or? Oh, uh, the question is, did I write, have I been pwned? No, I did not. Um, there, it's a, it's a Security, like I'm giving titles in front of uh, the person, but security MVP from Microsoft named Troy Hunt. And Troy Hunt uh, is a very uh, well-known security person um, out there. So um, he's either fooled everyone or it's, it's totally cool. <laughs> Probably a little of both, you know, he's a security person. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, so, so first of all, the database comes from basically data dumps, uh, data dumps from uh, like the internet. So anytime there's a breach and it gets pu published to like Pastebin or whatever, like they basically use that information for, for this database. Second of all, uh, your suspicions about sending passwords over the internet are exactly why there's, is exactly why there's a local version as well. So should you send it over the internet? Probably not. But you know, this service also exists for people that have no idea what they're doing. And are they going to download their own database and install it and do it? Probably not, right? And so, like, if they provided the software to check it for them, then they're just as vulnerable or more so because it could be malware on their computer. So I, I see your point, and I agree with you. Um, but from a practical standpoint, they provide both, uh, both mechanisms. And as developers that are security conscious, such as yourself, I would really recommend not doing the one over the internet. Yeah, a follow-up question. Yeah. So how do we use the local version of this? The local version? So um, there is, uh, there's a, it's documented on their site, like where to download the file and how to, how to go about doing that. So and then this uh, have a bit found being you can specify like this. So um, that the, the non-local one will be coming out soon. Ah. Yep, yep. All right. All right, cool. Anything else? All right, great. So um, let's go ahead and do some explicit Spring Security configuration so we can kind of see. Um, uh, well, maybe let's do this. One, one thing that I uh, think that would be valuable is if we went into our, um, into our Time Leaf template. Anyone here use Time Leaf at all? A few people? OK. So we're going to go ahead and uh, use, I'm just enabling uh, the Time Leaf security extension. And then I'm going to add, um, I'm going to add in here the ability to view the currently logged in user and the ability to log out. And I, I'll, I'll let you look at that. The first one is just the, X, the XSD declaration. So there's nothing exciting about that. But the next one is a little bit more interesting. I basically say, if uh, using that uh, declaration, I say, am I authenticated? If I am, then I'll output the authentication.name. And that's supported by the extension. And then otherwise, uh, I'm going to create a logout form. And the logout form uses cross-site request forgery protection, which we briefly talked about. Um, but it's automatically including this uh, token in the form because of the fact that we're using Timeleaf's TH action. That's kind of the and because it's a post. And I'm not going to go into details about like more about like, oh, now I have questions about cross-site request forgery because we kind of skipped over it. But it, you can always ask me after the presentation. But just know that that is including the token. That makes sense? All right. 
So now that I've done that, if I um, uh, recompile this, and then we come back to our IDE, now I see that I have user and logout up there. Make sense? So cool. All right, now let's go ahead and add our custom security like we were talking about just a second ago. And the best way to start off, I think, is really just doing something that looks um, a lot like our, uh, the default. So we'll let's take a look and see what that looks like. Let me do this too. It's probably hard to see in the back, so I'll put it up towards the top. And what we're doing here is we're defining a bean. And for those that aren't, haven't really done security uh, or have done it and haven't maybe haven't updated or whatever there used to be a web security configure adapter that you extended and you used to do a configure method now the uh, proper way of doing it is with a bean and i won't go into the details of why but you can ask me uh, after the after the presentation if you want so i'm going to go ahead and configure this and the first thing we're going to say is any request must be authenticated all right, and then the next thing that I want to do is I want to say that form login we'll use with defaults, okay? And we'll also say that um, uh, HTTP basic with defaults. And we'll also say that we can log out with defaults. And this is roughly what you're going to get um, with the default configuration. There's a couple things that are still enabled by default, like the cross-site request forgery. Um, HTTP security headers and, and stuff like that. But this is kind of a, a rough outline of what, what's uh, happening by default. All right. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to deviate a little bit and uh, maybe, well, let, maybe let's get a show of hands. Who wants to do something a little experimental? Experimental? All right. Let's do something experimental. It's, uh, it's always fun to do something experimental. Um, so I talked, I talked a little bit about like the storage of passwords and like the troubles that we have with passwords in terms of like, well, what if they type in a password of password? You know, how can we protect our users? But another way we can protect against passwords is not using them. And so what I'd like to show you today is uh, the new passkey support that we're working on. Does anyone know what passkeys are? few hands. OK, who here uses pass keys uh, for their logins? Got a couple. All right. Very cool. Um, so who, uh, it looks like it's pretty new to people, and I'm not surprised. That's pretty, pretty common. Um, but let's take a look and see how we can add pass keys. And um, first thing that we're going to do is we're going to come out here, and we're going to go to Go to a repository. So this is like kind of my, uh, it will be merged into Spring Security Project in some form or another. But for now, it's uh, living on its own. And I'm, I'm doing this in front of you so that you can see how to do it yourself. But the main thing is, is like, go to this repository. And I'll make sure that I add the repository to the readme so you can find it there. Um, so all you really need is a GitHub repository. So um, don't worry about grabbing the URL if you aren't able to. I'll copy this dependency. And we'll go to um, the build.gradle. And so what I've done is uh, I've added, uh, whoops, sorry. I just realized I did it wrong. First I added the dependency. And then there's a Maven repository. And it talks about how to how to get this Maven repository. It's on your local machine, and you have to update the path. But basically, you invoke a Gradle command, and it creates, a, uh, creates the repository locally. And you can do the same thing for Maven. Uh, it shows you how to do it for Maven as well, so don't worry about that. Um, so that's a local spot on my computer. I've already done the command to create the repository to save us a little bit of time. All right, so now that we've done, now that we've done those two things, um, the other thing that we need to do is we need to update our YAML file, um, our spring uh, configuration. 
And the easiest way to do that is to come out to one of these samples that we have here and copy this. So again, I'm just kind of showing you exactly how you would go about doing this in your own um, so that you're able to do it. And we need to do it in this one. And I will tell you, I'm almost guaranteed to mess this up due to, um, due to uh, like too many spaces or something. So I'm going to hope that I got that right, but I always go cross-eyed trying to figure out YAML files and spacing. But it looks pretty good to me at the moment. We may revisit that. But what this is doing is it's defining a SSL bundle, and it's saying that I need some certs. And the reason for that is one of the things about pass keys is that it needs to use HTTPS kind of. I say kind of because it depends on your browser. It depends on your operating system. It depends on your provider of the pass keys. Um, there's a whole debate about, like, should it happen for localhost? But we're going to do that because you may need that, right? Um, and then the other thing, this bundle is just a way that Spring says, I have some keys. I want to use them in some places. Maybe I want to use it in my REST template or my web client or whatever. Or maybe I want to use it on my server. So I've defined it to use it on my server here. OK? So now that we've done that, we need some keys. And who here knows how to create uh, um, keys off the top of their head? All right, we got one person. Come on up. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's kind of a pain, honestly. So um, there's actually this really nice tool called MakeCert. And it's going to do it for us. And it does it for localhost to make sure. So one of the tricky things that's even, even trickier about <laughs> The, the way that I found these pass keys when you're doing local development is some of the, some of the integrations require it to not just be uh, over HTTPS. And some of them don't just require you to trust the certificate. Some of them trust, make you have a trusted CA that signs it. No trusted CA is going to sign localhost, because who owns localhost, right? So you have to create your own, sign, sign the certificate with it, and then explicitly add the CA to your operating system. Make sure it does all that for you. So it's pretty nice. All right, so we've done that. And now the next thing that we need to do is we need to update our security config. So we'll go to security configuration. And for the sake of making it easy again, we'll uh, go ahead and go to source main security config. And there's a section in here that allows you to copy. And you might find this with. A little, in, uh, a little funny. And the width is there, um, and it looks like this time, looks like this time uh, my build.gradle did not get updated right away. So we'll go ahead and refresh and hope that that updates my class path appropriately. Yep, there it goes. All right, so um, you might find the width a little uh, odd, but the width is basically something built into Spring Security's DSL that allows you to add your own custom DSLs. And so in this case, my, exten my extension for web uh, authn or passkeys, passkeys is built on web authn, is in a separate repository. So it's not on the main DSL, so you have to use this width. As it gets integrated to Spring Security, it will have a proper fir uh, first class citizen. But if you have your own desire to do your own custom DSLs, you can refer to the Spring Security reference, and it will show you how to do that. All right, cool. So we did uh, start that up. And we'll see if we got everything correct. So the first thing that we'll expect is that this does not work. Why? We're using HTTPS now, right? So actually, I should just do example.localhost. All right. So we, we have HTTPS, it's trusted, and we need to now do a passkey. So we're going to, I'm not going to talk a ton about in depth about how passkeys work, but I'm going to show you, OK? So we're going to say, all right, passkeys, and then we'll say um, user, oops, user password. So we logged in. Now, oh yeah, Chrome has a, has a great thing that actually tells you to change your password. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, but uh, and I think that's because I was doing it. Let's do it back here, because I think I want to make sure that I do it in here, um, because it's the right size, and also because I've disabled one password, because it tends to be a little flakier over the network than, um, than 
uh, using uh, Androids. All right, so I've done that. And then just like we can generate a, um, generate a login or a logout, um, we've generated a management tool for adding passkeys. So once, like, there's a lot of different ways you can associate a passkey to someone. One would be, oh, I'll associate the passkey at the time the user creates their account. Another one is like, oh, the account already create, is created. How do I associate it? Well, let them log in and then add it, right? So that's what we're assuming here. And we'll just give it a label. Um, and then we'll go ahead and click register. And you'll see that it says Pixel 7 Pro. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just manage devices. And we're going to pretend that you didn't see that because I've already done this demo. And we're going to try it again. So it failed. That was expected. All right, so now I have this create a passkey on a phone or, uh, phone or tablet. And that's also expected. And I need to go back to here real quick to get a link. Um, but it's expected because um, it basically uh, is a way to associate a browser and a phone together. And once you've done that setup, then you don't have to anymore. But what we're going to do right now is hope that all of the internet gods are allowing. We couldn't get my phone to connect to the Wi-Fi, so I've had some issues with my uh, with my uh, mobile data. Okay, this is a new one. It says you are sharing your screen to Canada. Be careful. <laughs> All right. I love the label, too. I'm like, hey, Canada. <laughs> Everyone in Canada can now see it. Um, it's a pretty good one. So let's see if this works. All right, we have power. All right, so. All right, so now, now we see that. So now what I need to do is I need to actually scan this. So I'm going to scan it. I'm just using my phone right now. And maybe it's not, did it freeze? It's supposed to actually, let's try one more time. We might have to describe what's happening on the phone. Um, it says it's casting. Oh, it's just very laggy. I think it's because my, my, um, my uh, brought, let's see if it actually updates. We'll give it just a half a second. If it doesn't work, then we'll, we'll forget about it. Eh. All right, so I'm going to just describe what's happening on my phone. Um, internet trouble. Um, I think basically the connection on my uh, phone, like T-Mobile, uh, my internet provider is like using shared networks. And it's like, oh, you, uh, you're a lower priority than everyone else because you're roaming. So um, basically right now, I'm scanning with my uh, camera. And I'm going to click Use Passkey. And then after that, I just do a confirmation. And now the devices are connecting. OK? So now that, we've con now that we're connecting, um, hopefully it's going to connect. Hopefully that, that should work. OK, here we go. Um, now it's asking me, should I create a new passkey? And I'm saying yes. And then I have to unlock my phone using my fingerprint or however I have that set up. And now it's registered. OK? So now that I've registered it, I should be able to log out and then sign in with the passkey. So I'll click Use Passkey. And now, again, we'll see that I don't have to scan a 3D barcode again because I'm using the same one. And now it's connecting to my device. I'm going to say Use My Passkey. And I'm going to Authenticate. And I'm logged in. All right. So. What was happening behind the scenes? I'll give a very high level overview. First of all, I was having some internet traffic with my phone. Everyone knew about that. But more importantly, I was authenticating using public private keys. Does anyone know what public private keys are and how they're used? Does, ever, does anyone not know? No one's going to raise their hand. At a very high level, the private key must be private. That's why it's called private. Public key can be shared with anyone. And it's, I could share it with Canada, and it'd be fine. Um, or the whole world. It doesn't matter. Public keys are public. Um, and the thing is, is like when I'm doing something, like if you think about it, when, when I like, uh, sign for a credit card statement or whatever, they're val like people supposedly validate my signature, right? 
So I create a signature. Um, and they do that by comparing it against an existing signature. Well, in the, in the computer world, I can sign something with a private key. Only I can sign it because I haven't shared it with anyone. But because the public key is public, anyone can verify that signature, right? And it's, it's not as easy to forge as a, as a signature of a human because this is cryptography, right? Like it's cryptographically you know, defined that you can't actually do that. Can people do it? Well, lots of computing resources, lots of, you know, you know, you probably can at some point, depending on all the parameters, but it's next to impossible to do it. Um, and so um, the public key is then used to sign something. So what this is doing is it's receiving something from the server to sign. It's signing it and then sending it back to the server, and the server basically validates, because it has the public key, it doesn't have the private key, it validates with the public key that it got signed and that it matches. Does that make sense? And this is phishing resistant too because part of the message is this is all done by the browser. If I go to, you know, if I wanted to hack someone, I said uh, visit bank.com and log in, but I spelled bank with uh, like CK or something like that. Um, or I did, you know, slide off. You know, a lot of humans would get tricked and they'd type in, you know, if it looked like it, they'd type in their credentials and then then I'd have them, right? Or I could do something like, you know, bank. Uh, bank.secure.login.evil.com. Okay, probably not the evil.com, but you get the idea. A lot of people would probably still enter their credentials. But this would put the domain in the signature and submit it. So if the evil.com stole it, it would only have something signed for evil.com. It couldn't submit it again to the actual bank.com. So bank.com would reject it because it was the wrong domain. Does that make sense? So all that said, should I be using pass keys? You know, I get that question a lot. Should I use pass keys and replace, or replace passwords everywhere? And I, I answer that with another question. How many people did you see were using pass keys in this room? Just a couple. And how many people knew about pass keys in this room? Not a ton. How many people in this room are technical? I would assume everyone, right? There might be one random person that might not be, but I, I'm guessing everyone in this room is technical. So, Maybe they use them, but they don't know they are using Yeah, yeah, possibly. But so the, the problem, though, is like when if you switch your apps over to this and you say, all right, all our apps are switched over, no more passwords, whew, I made them secure, and then grandma tries to log in, right? Grandma is like, who do I ask, right? So I think pass keys are more of a supplementary thing for the moment, and they're not really a solution for uh, like pa passwords. They're not a replacement just yet. They're a supplementary way to log in, much like how you have a pin and biometrics to log into your phone or your computer. Does that make sense? Any questions around pass keys? Yes, please. Um, so does it protect against like, uh, session hijacking? Um, does it protect against session hijacking? Um, I think the answer is it depends, <laughs> like a lot of things. Um, Session hijacking can happen a lot of different ways. Um, so I, I guess it depends. Like, do you have anything particular in mind uh, on that? So, OK, yeah, I, I think the answer is it depends. Because the thing is, is like, you can hijack a session after you've entered your credentials, because there's like a cook, you know, like the cookies being submitted. So if you're going over HTTP with the, the cookie, which a lot of people don't do anymore, it's really hard really hard to do now because the browsers are kind of strict about it. But if you did that, do that, a man in the middle could steal that and hi hijack the session. So I mean, there, there's still ways to do it. Um, like if they steal the credential that's going over the wire, it's time sensitive. So they'd have to use it pretty quickly. So it does help reduce that window of time. But also the, um, the requirement for pass keys to work with your browser and stuff like that is actually to use HTTPS um, some of them are okay with it over localhost. Some of them are not. Some, you know, like I went through those kind of rules earlier, but mo like all of them are going to require it for like a real domain and stuff. Does that make sense? So that that can help you also. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Yes, please. So the SSL bundle you define there, that's that's native to Spring Boot, right? Yes. That's all Spring that Boot. That support's amazing. I love it. Um, so if I were running this in a development environment or a production environment to do pass keys. 
I go to like a cert signing body and then get my actual like bundle for the machine that I'm running that on? Yes. So. So uh, the question is, if I was doing this in production, I, I would have to generate the certificates, and then I put it on the machine that I was running that on, and the answer is yes. Now, the, the tricky part is, is like, you want to be able to manage these certificates securely as well, right? And like, how you do that is really dependent upon the environment that you're deploying to. Like, would I recommend you doing that for something like Amazon or like uh, any of the cloud providers? No, they have like solutions built in that like, take care of that for you. Um, this is really handy for situations where you don't already have something to enable that management. And I think actually, if it's not already there, I think um, they're working on uh, integration with um, uh, the ACME protocol. And, and I'm drawing a blank. Uh, help me out here, someone. What's Let's that? Encrypt. Let's encrypt. Thank you. Yeah, drawing a blank. Thank you. So yeah, they're working on uh, Let's Encrypt support, which is what many people call it, but Acme is the protocol that they came up with. Um, so there, there is uh, other, other support that will help, help you with that. But by and large, I would say if you already have inf infrastructure to do it, I would rely on that because it will help keep it more secure. If you don't, then this is good support. Good question. Anything else? All right. Let's move on then. Um, let's go ahead and we'll skip creating a custom login and go into something a little more exciting. Custom login is pretty easy, but we're going to go ahead and remove our passkey support and we'll look at creating our own custom authentication. So right now we're using a YAML file for our authentication, and it's not super real, is it? But it was pretty convenient to get started. But let's see how we can make it a little more, um, a little more real. So we've seen the user detail service earlier when we created our CVE controller. But now let's see how we can use it in a more practical way. Let me do that. So I'm going to create a user details, which is what the user detail service provides. And I'm going to do one with Rob. And I'm going to do this thing. And we'll talk about the with default password encoder in just a second. But I'm going to create a user. Oh, we want to do it, Rob. And then I'll do password, password. And then we'll do roles, user, and build. And then what I'm going to do is I'm also going to create a user called Josh. Now that password, the default password encoder, what that's doing is it's actually encoding the password for me in the proper format um, so that it's actually not just plain text. It's actually going to end up being in memory as bcrypt. And a lot of people are like, oh, is that secure? And I'm like, no, that's why this is actually deprecated. It's more of a deprecate. It's never going away because uh, it's very convenient for users. But it's a warning for, for you, like, this is not actually secure because the password is embedded in the source code. But is it more secure than having it in the source code and in memory? Yes. So it's better. It's it's slightly better, um, but mostly it's just very demo friendly and getting started friendly. So we'll go ahead and return these two. Whoops, I keep doing that, Josh. So now we have two users, and we'll go ahead and restart our application. And since we added the support to, um, see if it. Oh, it's just not started. You know what I think it is? I think Zoom is like killing all my CPU cycles. I'm like, why is this so slow? Um, Zoom, that kind of makes sense. Uh, so anyways, um, let's do that. So I'll go ahead and log in as Rob. And you saw a user was there beforehand. And that's a little deceiving. Um, a lot of people are like, hey, what just happened? Did I see that? And you did see that. But what happened was I have the dev tools on. And the dev tools basically saves the session to disk between between restarts. So what happened was I was already logged in as user, and then I stopped it, and it was, the session was saved to disk. So when I restarted, you notice I didn't have to log in. It was already logged in as the user that was persistent to the session. So it was a, a little weird thing. If you don't quite wrap your head around it, just nothing to see here. Um, but if you did, like that'll help you explain it if you ever encounter it yourself. Um, so now you see I'm logged in as Rob, and I can also log in as Josh. 
So that's, that's kind of cool. At least now I'm able to do like multiple users. But now I have this kind of trouble of where I'm like logging in as uh, like I'm managing my users, but I also have these users for like my inbox. How do I kind of integrate the two things? And so what we can do is we can create a new way of doing that. So I have my own, I didn't go over this, but I have my own mess uh, message user object. And, and I have a message user repository. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a message user details service. And then we'll add, we'll get that picked up as a bean. And then I'm going to make it so that um, the message uh, user repository is added as a dependency. And then I'm also going to make this implement user details service. So now I have uh, a user detail service. And what I can do is I can actually delegate to my users repository. So we'll just say um, this.users.findByEmail. And we'll make the username the email. And then we'll return that. And because of the contract of this API, if this is null, I need to actually throw an exception. And I want to, sorry, I keep getting conscious about it being at the bottom because I know it's hard to see in the back if it's at the bottom. All right, so what we'll do is we'll throw a new username not found exception. Um, cannot find username. All right. So, but if I do find it, I need to return a user details. But right now I have a message user. And I could just straight up convert this into a user details. But that's no fun because then I only have a user details. What if I could, uh, what if I could do something a little more exciting? And I'll explain why I'm doing it in a little bit. But what if I could do something more exciting? What if I could return a user details and a message user? That could be fun. So we'll do that. We'll create a new class, it's, uh, and we'll call it message user details. I'm very good with my naming, right? So, and it has to be a class. And it extends message user, and it implements user details service, or user details, sorry. And then what I'll do is I'll create final. Um, I'm going to do something a little, looks a little strange here, but it'll help me. Um, and then we'll say uh, final uh, your details. Actually, uh, yeah, we'll just do it like we'll just do it like this. All right. So I'm going to generate a constructor, and then I'm going to say super. I don't know why I called it users. Probably because I'm bad at naming things too. But um, I've done that. And then now we need to scaffold the user details API. So we'll do that real quick. Um, implement methods. And I don't actually have a notion of authorities in my app. But if I did, I could just grab that out of the database like uh, I did uh, the other stuff. The username is actually going to just be my email, as I talked about earlier. So I'll just map that. And I'm just going to do authority, um, create authority or list role user. All right, so now I have an object that is both a message user and a user details. Now all I have to do is say new message user details and message user. So now I'm returning something that is both. And we'll see how we can use that in just a second. So now that I've done that, I am going to show you how to use that. Um, so the thing that the other thing you'll notice is when I'm in this application, if I'm logged in as Josh, I'm still seeing a message from Josh in my inbox because I'm not changing who it's from, right? And you might be wondering why, and the reason why is because this is a demo, right? No, it's because I hard coded it because it is a demo. So right now I just have the current user ID is zero, but how would I get that in a real application, right? A lot of times I see people having like user details, and then they like use something on the user details to look it up in the database every time they need it, and it's like kind of cumbersome. right? So 
what if I could do something a little more easy? I could do something like this. So there's an annotation in Spring MVC called, or in Spring Security that you can add to Spring MVC called authentication principle. And that principle object is whatever you return from your user detail service, if you're using user details, that is. And so what I can do, you know, some people might say, oh, I could do user details. That's fun. But what if I could say message user, current user? I can do that, because remember, it's both a message user and a uh, user details. And then I can go into here, and I could say current user dot get ID. And I should probably just get rid of this so it doesn't pop up again. And then in here, I can do the same thing. Authentication principle, message user, current user. And then we'll do that. Current get ID. So now I'm querying the database uh, for the, u the user information that's being specified through there. Now you can also actually, there's integration with Spring, MB, or Spring Data as well that you can actually refer to the current user in your queries if you specify the query. So you could do that as well. We're not going to do that today, but just know that that's available. And so now if I rerun my application, take just a second. I probably should just enable the live reload, but it's, we'll do that next time. Oh, uh, current user is null. Oh, mm, let's see here. Message user details service. Let's make sure this is actually happening. Maybe do this. Oh, yeah, OK. You know what? Uh, I'm pretty sure I know what got me, but we'll see. Bad credentials. Uh, Rob at example.com. I'm going to do this. OK. So what, what happened? Remember earlier I said if you don't log out, the session's persisted? Well, what was persisted to disk uh, from the session was not a message user and a user details. It was just a user details, so it got mad at me. So now if I log out, josh at example.com, um, now you can see the inbox is updated from Rob. OK? Make sense? Is that cool? All right. Um, we're starting to get close to end of time, so I'm going to do a little more choose your own adventure. Um, who wants to dive into method security? And who wants to dive into um, OAuth? So let's first see method security. Raise your hand. Couple of hands. Who wants to do OAuth? All right, it's OAuth. <laughs> OAuth it is. All right. So uh, I love when the audience participates. All right, so um, we're going to go ahead and uh, dig into a little bit about OAuth. And we're not going to do Anything too crazy, but who wants to do something experimental again? It is a little crazy. OK, it is a little crazy. So we're going to do something a little experimental again. Um, let's take a look and see what we're about to do. So first, we're going to go to our build.gradle. So I already got a feel for who knows some things about uh, OAuth and who's used it. But we're going to go ahead and make this a little more exciting. So the first thing that I need to do is I'm going to update my Maven repositories. And the reason for that is really um, because I'm going to use a snapshot, because we're doing something a little crazy. And then I'm also going to say build um, OAuth, dependencies OAuth. So I have, uh, I have some dependencies here. So if you've done anything with OAuth, you've probably, with Spring, you've probably seen this dependency. This one's pretty familiar. But as you might have guessed by the dependencies, we're going to do something experimental. So we have a thing called test jars. Has anyone heard of test jars? Anyone? So this is one of my side projects. Um, and uh, test jars is, anyone use uh, Docker containers or test container support with their app? So one of the things that uh, it, that makes it really nice is if you have a Docker container, you can do like testing or development very easily, right? But what if you don't have 
that. What if you just have a Spring Boot application? Should you have to bundle it up into a container to do development? Well, you kind of do right now, but enter test jars. Test jars is test containers for Spring Boot applications. So what we're going to do is, anyone ever do like an authorization server and you're like, ah, oh, I have to connect to the authorization server, but I don't have one running locally. I'll disable security and then push it to prod without re-enabling security. Remember that? Yeah. So I don't want you to have to do that. So instead, test, container, or test jars will allow you to start up your authorization server so that you don't have to disable security and you can run it locally. Cool? Let's see how we can do that. All right, so the first thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to go out to um, this GitHub repository, Projects Experimental, and go out to here. So I just want to kind of show you, like I did a little bit of stuff, but it actually tells you what to do, what you can do on, on here. So I, I cheated a little bit um, to make it a little faster, but it's going to tell us how to do that. And then there's also a sample. So we're going to, you can do it from the readme. I always like samples because uh, who updates readmes? Probably not me, so I'm using the sample. This is tested. All right, um, let's see. Okay. Samples to log in. Oh, right. So we have to go into here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab um, all of this stuff. And we'll explain it in a second. And hopefully I can get it to line up on our YAML file, application YAML. And so in here, I have the security. And so this looks pretty typical, probably, if you've seen the OAuth config. You can obviously do it in the Java config as well, but we're going to stick with the YAML. Um, but I commented out the provider, because that's going to be magic in a minute. So I'm just showing you that this is the part that's going to happen automatically for us. All right, so I have all that. Um, I've updated my dependencies. And you know the one thing I didn't do was refresh my Gradle. Um, it's going to be mad if I don't do that. So let's do that. And then the next thing that we really need to do is we want to make sure that we update our um, security config before I forget that. So in here, right now we're doing these, but I really only need to do auth2 login. And then the next thing that I need to do is I need to set up, uh, set up the testing stuff. So if you've done any, any bits with testing uh, test containers, this should look fairly familiar. We're going to start off with a auth z config class. And then uh, in here, I'm going to make it a configuration. And we'll do that. And then I'm going to also do this thing called enable dynamic property. And enable dynamic property is basically a way to enable our um, enable the support that we're going to do. And I'll go over that in a little more detail in just a second. And the next thing we're going to do is, um, just for the sake of time, I want to make sure we get through all this. We're going to copy paste from here. Oh, not from that one, sorry. Maybe, oh, I think I did do it in there. Yep, there it is. We're doing it a little differently, but it'll still work. Um, this is actually preferred because you externalize it for testing as well. Um, so there we go. And I'm going to go over this in just a second. But basically, this is going to start up our authorization server right here. This is our authorization server startup. And then I need to also create a, uh, typically, you'll do a separate one called test. So you just name it. My app is called Messages Application. But I'm going to do, you always add test in front of that for the convention. And then I'll do spring application dot from messages application. Uh, it doesn't like that. Main. And then we need to with. So this is going to add our authorization configuration. So what I'm doing here, for those that aren't familiar with it, this is like the test container support. But I'm creating a test class, because on my test class path, I have test jars. Or, um, and just like you have the test container support there. And so whenever I want to do in development time the, the stuff, 
you start it up with this extra class that points to your test class path and allows you to start up all your development dependencies. And then we'll just say run args. OK, so now that I've done that, um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and start it up. And we'll see. Now, if I start it up messages application, which I want to do, this is going to fail. OK, so it'll fail. And the reason why it'll fail is because it doesn't have all the configuration it needs. It doesn't have, like, it's, it, remember we commented out that bit, right? But if I start it up here on the test side, it starts up. And so you'll see another one start up. Why, why did I see Spring twice? Well, one of them is the authorization server, right? So I just started up my authorization server. OK, so now I'm going to go ahead and log in. And I'm going to tell you ahead of time, this will fail. It's going to log in. Well, it should log in, but it will fail to um, hit the page that we want. Because remember, we had that custom user object. OAuth basically has changed back to like a standard Spring Security object. So we'll have to, if we have time, we'll go ahead and change that object so that it's both an OAuth, uh, OAuth object and a, uh, our message user object. But it'll lo it should log in. Um, and so I actually have, to, I don't remember what the password is for that. So let's do this. Let's look it up. I was going to do it in a different order, but I'm just having a, a moment. Rob at example.com. Okay. So rob at example.com. So now I log in. I logged in, but I get a 500. And we all know what the 500 is because we talked about it before it happened. But we were able to log in, and it started up. And you notice our authorization server started on 127.0.0.1 in our random port. The, random, the port is random. And the mapping that our application discovered that was dynamic. Um, so if if this port was taken, we'd actually start up on a different port, and it, uh, the application would discover that as well. <clears throat> and how is that all happening? I'm glad you've asked, because we're going to talk about that. Um, authorization config. So in here, again, there's this enable dynamic property. And this is just kind of a standard enable uh, thing. Spring uh, test jars is composed of two different things. One, it allows you to map environment entries using an annotation. And this is our annotation. It's just a shortcut. So what it does is it says, OK, I'm going to add this property. It should look very familiar. Spring.security.oauth2 client provider, provider name, issuer URI. Looks very familiar, right, if you've done OAuth? And the default value for the provider name is Spring, but you could override that. And then the value of it is 1270.0.1. That's the IP address that we saw earlier. And then the port. Where does the port come from? This is a spell expression where the context root is the bean that this creates. So this bean is creating an object that has a method called get port on it. And get port returns the current port. So there's nothing, this, this, uh, this support for dynamic properties has nothing to do with the authorization stuff. It just didn't exist yet, so I had to create both. Um, Spring, the next version of Spring is actually adding something similar to this, so I'll be able to remove it. Um, and so there's that. And then the other thing is, is just this builder for creating a Spring Boot application um, using Commons Exec. All it does is it delegates to Commons Exec, starts up a Java process. Um, and what is it doing here? Well, it adds to the class path the Spring Boot Starter OAuth 2 authorization server. OK, probably familiar with that. But it also adds this main method, the default main method. Why does it do that? Well, when you do start.spring.io, like, it always generates a main method, right? But it's pretty skeleton. It's, like, it, it's a template. It's always the same thing, maybe a different name. So this is just adding that to the class path so it knows like, how to start up. You can override that if you want, um, but, but that's how you define it. And then the other bit that's, uh, that's a little bit hidden, because I already did this, and you saw me look at it just a second ago, there's, a there's some conventions here. So the name of my bean is authorization server, right? And so in my tests, resources that you probably can't read over here, but I'll read it to you. Test, resources, a folder called test jars, and then authorization server, the bean name, application YAML. 
So that's where this is located at. And this application YAML gets applied to that bean. So this is where my authorization server config came from. Does that make sense? So the patient match, right? Yeah, the bean, name, the bean name and the YAML file, in order to line up, you have to match it. You can explicitly do it too, but this is just, again, like a convention to make it easier. All this, all this stuff that, um, that you saw here, this is just a utility to easily use Commons Exec and integrate with, uh, with Spring Boot applications. And the other thing that it's doing behind the scenes is it's actually doing a little bit of magic so that it can report what the uh, port is once it starts up. Because a, a lot of time, like, how would you discover that? Well, under the cover, Spring Boot has a thing that'll log out, create the, write the port that it started up onto to a file. So but what we do is we make sure we enable that using like a class path uh, recognition for uh, spring, uh, spring dot factories. And then we also watch for that file to exist in the temp folders, because that's where we tell it to get created. And when it gets created, we know it's started. And uh, once we know it's started, then we can actually report what the port is. Does that make sense? All right. Now, I did say that we could fix the, fix the, uh, the message user uh, object. I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you. It's in the source code. You can look through the, co the commits. There's going to be more commits in there because we did a little choose your own adventure. So if you're confused, like, hey, he didn't go over that. It's pro yeah, I probably didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I always like to kind of let the audience kind of decide our direction. But um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up now for a few more questions, if anyone has any. Yes, please. Yeah, the question is, uh, when you're using test jars for like this authorization server, is it its own class path or is it shared? And the answer is it's its own process. So it's, it's its own class path. Now, you can actually tell it to share some of the, some of the class path if you explicitly do so. And, and uh, if you look at the, I've kind of covered it up. It, it's a little tricky, but if you, man. I am having bad luck with hovering over things. Um, if you look at it, it says Spring Boot Starter, and I have no version on there. Well, the version that it uses that is defaulted to the version that is on your class path so that they align. But it's actually pointing at, like, it actually resolves through, like, a Maven, Maven, uh, like, anyone know about Ether? Like, Maven, Maven has a project called Ether that does dependency resolution. It's using that behind the scenes. So it's, it's actually doing all, all of the dependency resolution itself, but it's the same. It's downloading from the same location. So, uh, like we can specify a different version. There will be no jar headlet. Correct. Yeah, you can, you can define your own version, but then you, you're in charge of specifying the version and stuff at that point. And it doesn't, so right now I just did a Spring Boot starter. Um, you can actually, and, and I did authorization server, but let's say you extract messages out into its own API, like you have a REST service, right? You have a REST service, and you need to communicate with that REST service because it's just the web app. You can actually compile that jar and then tell test containers to start up the, that API and wire that in, too. Yeah, so it, it allows you to, I'm not sure if that's re, GA, the non-Maven Central, but there is at least a snapshot that allows you to do that. And if you complain enough, I'll do another release. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of bouncing all over the place. But yeah, if you complain, complain on the tickets, I'll do a release. But it's at least in snapshot mode where you can uh, specify your own Maven repository. And you can also actually already point to a local spot on the, fi uh, on the file system. So that's like, an, you know, they can always download it and put it on the file system and then point to that. Yep, good question. Any others? Yes, please. What's test jar support like for other identity providers? Or is it the expectation that the engineering team will make like this IDP for the authorization server to behave just like you would in your other environments? Yeah, so the question is, what is the expectation for test jars with other identity providers? And what I would uh, say to that is, test jars really has no expectations of anything other than it's a Spring Boot app. So if you've created a Spring Boot app, whether it be an identity provider or a REST API, you can start it up with test jars. So if your identity provider is, is a Spring Boot app, 
you can start it up. Now, you might run into, there's still some stuff where I want to make it easier to do like, because a lot of times people publish like a production jar, right? But how do you do development, easily do development mode on something that's published for like a, a service? Because so we're going to, st there's still work to be done for sure, because you know, it might require a database or something like that. But I'd, in the end, you'll be, they'll be publishing, like we'll probably make it so you can set up and publish like a, a jar with a classifier or a variant, depending on which build system you're using. And then that will basically allow you to automatically pull in like the Docker, Docker dependencies and stuff like that. Make sense? Yeah. 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 We've got like a part two in this sort of Yeah, go ahead. We've done something very similar with like Spring Cloud contracts back in the days where you're oh, yeah. building your stuff. Just like, does this replace that? So the question is, uh, they've done similar stuff with Spring Cloud Contract, and does that replace it? Um, I think it. I think it's uh, it's a little different because I think um, Spring Cloud Contract is is not as dynamic as this would be. And the I say that because like, how would you simulate an authorization server with Spring Cloud Contract? So I think I think it's like a slightly different use case. Um, I would almost view it as like um, a development slash testing mode for integration tests versus like um, uh, unit tests. It's probably not unit tests, but it's more of like in, in between between unit tests and integration tests. And there's like a million names for it, so I'm not going to use any. But you get the idea. It's like one is integration, and one is one is like uh, you know an in, in between integration and unit testing. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think there's a place for both of them, honestly. Yeah. Good question. Any others? All right. Well, I think I ended right on time, probably because people need to stop asking questions. But I really appreciate your guys' time. Thank you so much for coming out. And, and thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.